Hello, I'm Jim Schaefer, the executive producer and host of Rip Raff, the academic book television program. Our guest today is Phyllis Birnbaum, the author of Modern Girls, Shining Stars, The Skies of Tokyo, Five Japanese Women. Well, oh, that's a, one of the most interesting <laughs> titles. Long. I've written. Yeah, well, long, but kind yeah. of evocative. Uh -huh. um, as I told you when we were pre preparing for this program, I, I have to thank Ken Ito for, yeah. at the Japanese Study Center at University of Michigan uh, for priding me about bringing your program <laughs> on the book because I had it on the list of possibilities and then he suggested I take another look at it and I found it was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. But how did you get in the started in the, into this project? Uh -huh. Well, I started it, uh, it started out as magazine articles for The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. The editor at that time, when I first started the book, was very interested in Japan. And I was interested in writing for The New Yorker at that time. But the problem was that I had to find something kind of exciting, because a general interest magazine wouldn't really be that interested in Japanese topics that were sort of ordinary. So I had to look for very racy, or I felt I had to look for very racy people, because you know, a general interest magazine, if you say I'm going to write about Japanese author, they tend to sort of weep, you know, <laughs> because they feel, oh, this is not going to sell any magazines. No one's going to be interested. So I purposely, I went out of my way to find somebody who had a very racy life. And that was the first one I wrote about, who was Uno Chio. And um, the way it really got started, would you like me to tell Go you ahead. about it? Um, so the New Yorker felt that I would have no trouble getting an interview with Uno Chio. She had a very interesting life. She was married many times, and she was reckless in everything she did. So she was really made for um, TV or for a magazine. But the problem was that at the time she was about 90, and she had really no interest in being interviewed by this magazine, The New Yorker. She lived in Tokyo. She had never heard of it. She didn't want to be bothered by Phyllis Birnbaum. And she didn't really, I had translated her book, which I felt gave me an entree into her life, but she was not feeling well, she had a backache, and she really felt that it was going to be a big production. So everybody I asked to um, get me an introduction, they said she was not interested. Why is this woman bothering me? <laughs> that's, what, that's what she said. And then finally somebody did get me in, into, um, I, and also I should say that I felt I could write it without her, uh, without meeting her, because she wrote many autobiographical works, and I could have cobbled up something, you know, because I could have just quoted it. But, you know, when you're writing for a magazine, they want you to interview the person if the person is alive. That's part of journalism. So I, I had to, I had to go and meet her. And then I had to get her to say something, and um, she was nervous, and I was nervous. And then she did say one great thing to me, which was when she met one of her husbands, I asked her, well, why um, were you interested in him? And she told me she was interested because he had a bandage on his neck. He had attempted suicide. Oh, yeah. He had attempted suicide. And um, she said um, she fell in love with him for that reason, and that um, they went home together. and. She said, they fell, in, they fell upon each, she said in Japanese, they fell upon each other like animals, you know, so this was my sentence. <laughs> so finally I could write the article, and um, so that's really how it, how it got started. And actually, when the article was written, it was so racy that after it was written, some people in England really uh, liked, the, liked her, and they kept calling her and asking her to be on TV, and she, she really did live to regret. She wouldn't appear because she didn't want any more of these people coming in and bugging her. But um, sh she had to, you know, keep these people out. BBC was after her for a while. So that's how it got started, as magazine articles. So it took a while before you were able to interview her. Oh, yeah. It took me. I was in Tokyo for a month. The thing is, if you're in New York, everybody thinks, oh, if you say you're working for some magazine, that the people will welcome you. But that's not true. Tokyo... People don't read those magazines, and they hardly care. And it's a, it's a bother. It's a, is it a different style of interaction to where you need to know someone who knows someone? Actually, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to. Um, although I had translated her work, so I, I had a little bit of an easier time. But yes, I would have had. I had to go through somebody. I couldn't just appear on her doorstep. Well, it's fascinating. She had five women that all were different. Uh huh. There was, what, two actresses, two writers, and a painter. Well, th then after that, 
um, then I really was on that I was really interested in finding others who were exciting so I next start did a Japanese film star and um, and then I was she she had a more moderate life than Unochi or Takamine Hideko but by then I was hooked on these because it's much easier to write about someone who has an exciting life rather than someone who stayed at home and wrote great books I, I don't mean to denigrate people who write great books just sit home write great books but for a magazine article or f to get people's attention and I suppose it's my own personality I would prefer to have a kind of hook of somebody who's racy and then I can branch out and kind of give information or be serious but I think for myself I also need some kind of fabulous beginning or something. Well there's an interesting comment you had in your prologue well, uh -huh. these women were stimulating because of their capacity for work mischief and love uh -huh. but they're also wearing and you weren't exactly sure that you would want them as neighbors <laughs> or something. Well I did feel that about them they were um, they accomplished a lot they defied society you know they um, they really did what they wanted to a remarkable degree for a Japanese woman especially women of those days but at the same time you start to feel the relentless pressure of their energy and also the re you know that they were cruel often to get your way you can't be kind and thoughtful to others all the time and I felt I would have had some difficulty with that I think you, s you can feel that in great relief great uh, with great uh, I, I don't know I felt it very strongly that um, that they were accomplished, but also impossible to be with at <laughs> close quarters. We should give some historical context. Uh -huh. These were women after the, what, the Meiji Restoration. Nice. Yeah, they all were born after the Meiji Restoration. What, that's when Japan was uh, opened to the West, when w uh, by Commodore Perry chugging in. There was um, uh, lots of Western ideas of uh, individualism, especially, came into Japan at that time. And there was a brief period when women thought everything was going to change for the better. It, you know, it didn't dramatically change. But there was kind of unleashing of energies, thinking things. Yeah, I think, well, these women, uh, yeah, there was a, there were great uh, thoughts that uh, things would change uh, dramatically. One of the things I have to ask you about is why you use modern girls? Yeah. You know, because the feminist thing will say this. Thing. I see. Oh, that was uh, in the 1920s or so in Japan there was a vogue of calling women who were kind of modern, who wore western clothes, high heels, who cut their hair. These were called modern girls. In Japanese there's a modern garu is what they call it. And it is a Japanese word. So it doesn't mean that, I couldn't say modern women because they were known as modern girls. And there's a short form for them which is moga, the Japanese taking the first syllable of the two Japanese words, modern girl. So they were called moga. They were called modern girls. So I mean, no disrespect. Well, I, I, yes. I just had to bring that up. I know people will be asking yeah. me. You know, the people are definite feminists. And the so important they, thing about these women is these modern girls was um, that that their hair was cut. That was how they were distinguished. But most of all, that they kind of were challenging this, um, or you know, the traditional ways. That was what they were. They were thought to be dangerous. And some of these women were a little dangerous to have around. So it was the, the cutting of the hair, the behavioral patterns, the dress, uh -huh. and, you know, the whole style was comprised of that. Yeah. Well, take Matsui Sumako, one of the women in my book. She uh, was married, uh, married, then she got divorced, then she became one of the first Western, she was the first stage actress uh, before her men played women on stage. So she was the first to do the scandalous thing of she played Nora in a doll's house. She was Salome. And she also ran off. She was very talented, I need to emphasize. But um, she was impossible. She, her behavior um, was kind of, uh, she was very hot-tempered. And she also went off with her married stage director. So this would be modern girl supreme, you know. This would, people would be scandalized. She would be in, you know, everything she did would be noted. Um. How, and in your title, the, the, the thing about the uh, skies of Tokyo, uh -huh. what was that? Well, that refers to Takamura Chieko, who's also one of the women in my book. She was the wife of a 
very famous poet, Takamura Kotaro, and she herself had ambitions to be uh, a painter in the Western style. She was a very great fan of Cezanne. And, um, and, for, and he, was much, he was also a sculptor, and the reason she became famous was because her husband wrote a series of poems about her, about how, how much they loved each other and you know, how sh what a perfect love they had. But he also wrote about how she, unfortunately, went crazy. And those poems, I call it in English, Chieko Sky, because uh, one, of, one of the signs that she was crazy was uh, the fact that she said, Tokyo doesn't, Tokyo does, her sign of her depression was she came from the countryside and she complained that Tokyo, uh, there's no sky in Tokyo. Because mm -hmm. she was used to the sky of the countryside. Actually, that's kind of an interesting um, quality that, that I noticed in some of these women where they were born in quiet country villages uh -huh. and, uh, or provincial areas and then they'd be swept along. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Matsuo Sumako uh, was, she had this energy. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know. uh, she had too much energy. Yeah. Some people said, in my book, I discuss. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether the countryside had anything to do with it, but Tokyo it was, was like they were propelled. I mean, that they uh -huh. this quality carried them right out of what would be a kind of a quiet bucolic setting uh -huh. into the urban setting, into culture, into a prominent place in culture. Uh -huh. Well, in those days, a lot of uh, literary people were flocking to the center of the universe, which was. Tokyo. So there are a lot of stories of people who came from the countryside to make it in the big city. And uh, Tokyo was, you know, for th in those days, that was the center of the world. And she was the one that was uh, played these uh, instinctual women like Carmen and Salome. People said that she was typecast, that she really didn't have to act very much. And uh, she must have been very good. There, no, uh, we have no records, no film or anything of her appearing on stage. But uh, she must have been quite good because she caused a stir. They closed one of her performances as an affront to public morals because they were afraid of this, this woman on stage saying all these, uh, uh, you know, radical things. So she, she must have been. She wouldn't. She must not have been saying these things quietly. No, she I must have had conviction in her voice. And then you pointed out that Una Chio um, was a grand, regarded as a grand dam of ja Japanese letters, and uh, and she also came from a provincial area. Right. She uh, she came to Tokyo when she was uh, during her first marriage. Her husband. She was from. She was really from a distant place, and uh, her, she and her husband came to Tokyo. He was going to school there, and then she again. She made it. She made it big in the. Um, in the big city. But, you know, these women uh, were hustlers. They were, um, you know, what made them that way, I don't know, but they took advantage of an opportunity. Seems like they took advantage <laughs> of all the opportunities. Right, right. I was trying to find a pattern of how they use the dynamics. One th pattern seems to be, and in her case, is linking up with, with powerful men. Right. I, I don't want to diminish uh -huh. what she no. did, but she, she seems strategically uh -huh. to identify people who would be important. Yeah. I think it shows you how difficult it was for women to make it on their own, that these women really did need some powerful patron. It was, it it was hard to um, become you know, prominent without the support of the male, um, you know, male so the male supporters. But they also seem to make it on their own. Yeah. I mean, they had this energy yeah. and this audacity. Oh, and absolutely. They still had to fulfill the demands of their profession. Uh, yes, they were, they were talented. They were um, also a few, one, oh, I think only one of them had children. So they, they were, in many ways, they were very talented. They were, some of them were beautiful. Uh, all these things um, would help, right? I mean, that they, but this is magic, you know, what makes a woman able to do what they did. It's hard to explain, you know, what, what force of personality, because they must have been formidable uh, to overcome. Very intelligent. Yes, very intelligent, very talented, but also circumstances um, were in also in their favor. But they had that incredible uh, courage. They, when, you re when I read about them, they were brave. They, they really fought hard to get what they wanted. I was also wondering if the professions that they selected helped propel them into the public discourse, you know, the writing, painting, acting. Uh -huh. um, 
maybe that was part of the cultural upheavals after the Meiji Restoration? Uh, well, I'm not sure whether that was, I mean, writing is something that uh, women don't have to, women can do that at home. It's, it's, it's a career that if you have talent, you know, you don't have to work in a corporation or something like that. Matsui Sumako, she came just at the right time, you know, she uh, studied acting just at the right time when they were dying for women uh, who would appear in these Western plays which were just being imported to Japan. You know, before that they had men in kabuki or something like that, dressed as women. Those were traditional Japanese dramas. But now they were importing Ibsen and Maeterlinck and Hauptmann and people like that. And they didn't want a woman, um, a man, with pearls on and a Western dress. It, w it was enough. It, w it really, you know, strained credulity. So they were looking for women now to appear in these more modern productions. So she was just the right place at the right time. Did you get any sense of why that happened that way, why there was the change? Because the man portraying the woman had been going on for us. Well, you see, but they, they portrayed women in sort of plays that were older than, they weren't modern plays. They, so it was possible, you weren't trying to be realistic in a certain way, and people were accustomed to having men in kimono playing women. It was a long tradition. But now you were trying for reality. You were trying to change, you know, the aesthetic. And um, so reality required that it be a woman. And then, then she turned up. So they were looking for women. And also acting was considered such a disreputable rep uh, profession that only a woman like Matsui Sumako, who had already been divorced and, had so, had so, and therefore was a kind of outcast of society, could she dare to appear on stage? So these circumstances helped her also. One of the things that was interesting, and you point this out in your book, is about how some of the men who did biographies of these women were particularly vicious about uh, what they said in, you know, uh, portraying these women. And in in especially Matsui Sumako, that was, that was the one that was most striking. She was an impossible person, I believe. Uh, but the only documents that remain uh, by our people, uh, documents by contemporaries were written by men. We have nothing by women. So I, could, I had only those to refer to. And they hated her. That was a big shock to me. She was stingy. She thrashed other uh, actresses with kimono. She uh, used to, they used to get fruit as a gift when they were on tour. And she would take those home and resell them for, as profit for herself. So the men had a lot to criticize her for, but they didn't have a kind word to say about her. So uh, since I'm sympathetic to her plight, I had to kind of read between the lines or present to, to readers like yourself that perhaps the men were a little biased, that, she, you know. A little. <laughs> well, she must have been impossible. Yeah. I think we have to, you know, she must have been difficult to have around. We, we have to agree with that, but I think they, they just did despise her, and I think it, you know, was because, first of all, because she had run off with their colleague, uh, Shimamura Hogetsu, and they just couldn't understand. They blamed her completely for um, luring him away from respectability and from <coughs> his work. They had no idea that uh, he could have been attracted to her. It was, you know, woman as demon or something. Yeah, what well they say that the worst that he had done before he met her is to go off to. Yeah, him. it was this poor innocent beguiled by this. Uh, you might have a demoness. Drinks or something, right. but nothing wild. Mm -hmm. It's ama It was amazing to read to read something like that. You, it was comical, but you know that was. There's a, another element in writing these portraits. Um, where you said you'd started to form a very precise pr picture of the person and could even hear her voice and imagine how she approached the bowl of noodles. But then the flesh and blood person, yeah. with all their courage and tenacity, insisted on the existence of a completely different person. Uh -huh. I, I don't know whether that happens to a lot of people uh, who write uh, journalistic essays about people who are alive. But of course, just as you do, I prepared. I, I read everything they had written. And um, I would have preferred not to interview them, just to write what I, my idea of them. But I had to uh, meet them because I was writing a journalistic article. And they weren't at all like what I imagined. And that's quite disappointing because they have, if they say that this is their opinion, then you have to revise all your, you know, they have the final say in what they're going to be represented as. And um, 
that's kind of disappointing that your image of the person is quite different from what you imagined. It, it, it takes, it's a shock. In preparing this, you know, <laughs> these biased biographies that had, you had read in preparation, did that, uh -huh. how did that influence you to think, well, I've, maybe it's not quite like that and, you know, you're trying to sense uh -huh. all that out? Well, two of the people that I wrote about were alive. So in those cases, I had confirmation of what they were really li like, or my impression of what they were really like. But the biased biographies that I read were mostly about people who were dead. And so then I felt I was free to suggest places where these people could possibly be wrong, uh, suggest another interpretation. So I felt better writing about people who were no longer living because I felt I could uh, indulge my imagination a little bit more. But if the person is right in front of you, then they have a veto on all that. So that's why I've, I probably prefer writing about people who are no longer alive. It's quite an interesting exploration. How, how are these women regarded now in Japan? Um, uh, how do they view? Uh, well, all of them would be pretty well known to Japanese, uh, perhaps with the exception of the poet Yanagiwara Byakuren who, um, is, she's the poet who uh, was married to a coal mining executive in Kyushu and was very miserable for 10 years and wrote poetry about how miserable she was and then ran off in 1921, I think it was, uh, with a uh, uh, leftist uh, writer. And the way she announced that to her husband that she was divorcing him was that first she wrote a letter to the newspapers oh, announcing yes, this. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So the reason she did that was because in those days women who commit adultery could be put in jail. While men could have as many uh, mistresses as they liked, um, women could be put in jail. So she was trying to get public opinion behind her. Uh, a preemptive strike. <laughs> and. Uh, so she published this letter in the newspaper, and um, but instead of uh, getting public opinion behind her, she was a relative of the emperor, a close relative of the emperor, and people were outraged that she was doing such uh, immoral things, and there were riots in the streets. Of t uh, it was really had anyone ever done that before? No, that was her own idea. Somebody had advised her that this would be public, pub good public relations, that uh, this would be a good way to. Uh, not only get her husband, make her husband not uh, sue sue them and put her in jail, but I, s I suppose also the people around her lover, they wanted sort of to expose all the injustice uh, that was around her life, how, how she had been treated. So they did want to also cause a little societal stir. Well, I think you said in, in your book that the uh, final version of the document, really, was all she had that were her own words was the preface yeah. leading into it. Somebody had uh, somebody who was a friend of her husband's did uh, help her compose the final version, and then there really were riots. Uh, her her brother was a member of the House of Peers, and his house was stoned. He was forced to resign. All, really, all hell broke loose, and that writer of the letter just disappeared. So it turned into sort of a manifesto. Uh, yes, absolutely. But because of her affiliations with the royal family, uh, with the imperial family, she was in great difficulty. Her life was in actually in danger. They had to send her away, and uh, it was really a big right uproar. Things to come right. She was, uh, and then of course they didn't want her to marry this guy, but she didn't go to jail. So at least they accomplished that. But that seems to be what all of these women had, is this ability to find those intersections uh -huh. uh, where power and prestige and, you know, all that came together. And, uh -huh. and that seemed to bring them up to prominence. These people were lucky. There were many women, perhaps, who decided to, I mean, we know about these women, but I think there must be a trillion, you know, or what, many who didn't have this just fortunate, y you know, the reason that, that she was finally able to get together with her lover. They, her family kept them apart. And perhaps she would never have been able to get together with him. There was a great earthquake in Tokyo. And, um, you know, it was <laughs> the a earth huge... Moved. Right, the <laughs> earth moved. Really. And, you know, there was so much trouble in Tokyo that finally uh, they, they couldn't be bothered worrying about this couple. So how many people, you know, have that kind of good, bad fortune, good fortune? So I think these women also, you know, were lucky. Well, they didn't plan it. 
Right. You know, it was instinct. They were they were yeah. running on adrenaline. But it was also the combination of being propelled along by some of the elements and and what was going on at the time in Japan, because I mean, and they were propelled right. I mean, some of them were in traditional marriages where the husband had been selected and uh -huh. uh, and they were supposed to work in the village inn in one case, and yet uh, things didn't happen that way. Right, but in her case, you're talking about Matsui Sumako. Yeah. It's rumored that her husband gave her some kind of uh, sexual disease and so and then he divorced her this is a, you know he gave it to her and then yeah, you she talk gets about divorced that in the book. nice and it does the thing and right. blames her for right so because in those days uh, af before a certain amount of time had elapsed uh, the man could easily divorce the woman which is possible under these kind of feudal circumstances yeah, that yeah. they existed yeah in. and then she as a divorced woman she would really be in a very uh, difficult position. I mean, she so would have really no status. Yeah. Would so that's completely lost yeah. space. And there was the poet that they, they call Japanese reverse Cinderella. That's yeah. Well, that's the one who I who I just described, who was married to this rich coal mining executive, and then uh, she chose to run off with this much this gent man who was much poorer than that, and had to struggle. So usually, so that's why they called her reverse Cinderella. Yeah. Well, it's a really good read. I, I had uh -huh. a lot of fun with it. Um, uh, it it's uh, an interesting book because it runs, all five women just went completely against the grain of uh -huh. a lot of people think of uh, as Asian women. Uh -huh. uh, you know, complacent and following tradition, continuing customs and all of that. Well, but that really is, that really is a stereotype. I mean, Oh yeah, yeah, and that's that's the fun of it. I right, mean, in a yeah. sense, is to take a fresh, fresher look uh -huh. at uh, uh, you know the Asian culture because it is not the way the West thinks of it. It right. is static. Right. Uh, we just had a program on Chinese fashion, and uh, many people in the West think of Chinese fashion as being static and not unchanging, and that's uh -huh. certainly not true. Uh -huh. You know, there's variations, yeah, and different right. styles would come in, right. even to a having a tunic and pants and riding horses. It wasn't all these kimonos oh, right? and right. stuff like right. that. Right, so Oh, they were, I, you know, these are just five women. I'm sure there were many who were just as brave as they who did less celebrated things, but... Well, thank you for being on the program. Oh, oh thank you. My pleasure. Yeah.